early on, one of our one of our board members, uh, former founder of Charles River Ventures, early VC company from the seventies, uh, very successful. He he referenced what we were doing as the quality of our revenue. Welcome back to the Clean Techies podcast, where we interview climate tech founders and VCs to discuss all things building and investing to solve the biggest challenge of our generation, climate change. Today we are joined by Ryan Begin, who is one of the founding members of Divert. Divert builds and operates food waste to energy infrastructure projects. They work with food retailers to help them reduce total food waste and for the food waste that does occur, they turn it into renewable energy to be sold back to the local energy grid. It took them a long time, but after about 13 years, they perfected the technology and the model to then go on to raise hundreds of millions of dollars from infrastructure funds in order to go out and execute their mission. Key components of this conversation include how Ryan got into the space and left the defense space to be part of the founding team at Divert, the challenges and the milestones along the way for them to get where they are now, how they finance their business, how they got to the point of attracting infrastructure funding rather than just venture capital, and finally, the importance of having value aligned talent so your business can succeed. I really enjoyed this conversation and Ryan shared what I felt was a lot of helpful information for the climate tech entrepreneurs working on hardware or infrastructure problems. So without any further delay, let's get into the show. All right. Welcome. Welcome to the show, Ryan. How are you doing? Great. Thanks for having me. Yes. Yeah, super, super excited to have you. So why don't we just start at the beginning and let's get a bit of an intro to yourself and kind of what you're doing today. Sure. Uh, so Ryan Began, co-founder of Divert. We started the business 2007. Focus from day one has always been wasted food, retailers, and really just trying to find better solutions to tackle what is a really complex problem. And what what is that problem? Yeah, so uh, wasted food for us, it's the 63 million tons of food that goes to waste every single year in the U.S. That's between 33 to 40% of food that we produce uh, going unused, 50% of that goes into landfills. Uh, huge methane emissions issues. We have water issues that we are taking all these nutrients, uh, growing this food, transporting it, cooling it, getting it all the way through the supply chain. And then right at that last minute, we're throwing 30 to 40% of that into effectively the trash. So. Uh, that's the problem that we are, we've set out and really over the last 16 years, uh, trying to figure out how to approach the problem uh, and then do it at scale. And I think, you know, we've, we've recently had some success that's pushing us in that direction. That's great. I mean, I'm, I'm, one of, I'm kind of curious, how did you, how did you get into this space? Cause I'm looking at your, your background and I don't, I don't think it's very uh, obvious how you did. So could you tell us a little bit about your backstory, where you started and, and what led you here? Yeah, I assume you're probably referring to like the missile defense that doesn't really line up Correct. with wasted food. So <laughs> my undergrad is electrical engineering, um, always really fascinated with sustainability, renewable energy. Um, you know, I go back to like solar car and, and things that we were working on to just uh, try to use our resources more intelligently. Uh, from From college going into the hydrogen space. So this was like my first full-time job, um, you know, totally different environment where we, uh, the business had just IPO'd. So massive amounts of capital available, innovative technology. We were on the forefront of building the hydrogen economy. So really got to see what does it take to build the business from the ground up? Like, what do you get to experience? It's incredibly exciting. And, you know, from that also realized what a what what missed opportunities exist for a business model? So really getting that business model correct um, to be ready to launch with all of that capital. So from there, went on to my master's degree uh, into Raytheon for more sort of formal engineering experience. And that worked out really well. I, I took that juxtaposition from Proton Energy Systems, which is now Nell Hydrogen, uh, went, into Pro, went into Raytheon and like the engineering principles, how we approach problems, just completely different. Uh, the tools of like Six Sigma and principles of systems engineering, like just this like fundamental, uh, how to approach product development very differently. From there, I knew that I was a square peg in a round hole at Raytheon as much as I, I thought it was, you know, incredible experience. 
Uh, I knew that it wasn't the place for me. My heart was in renewable energy, sustainability. Uh, met up with two folks uh, that um, were excited about the space, collaborated, and you know leveraged my experience in that in that early startup phase to to build out the business. Interesting, and and I mean this is a while ago, so there wasn't exactly. I mean maybe maybe this was prior to the popping of the <clears throat> clean tech 1.0 bubble. But how could you talk a little bit about the experience of starting the company in that time and especially regarding funding and resources, because obviously it's it's pretty well ex- built out today, this infrastructure and this ecosystem, but I'm, I'm assuming it wasn't then. So could you talk about that? Hey there, quick break to remind any founders or VCs listening. If you are looking for deal flow, seeking to raise funding, looking for partners to help service your needs, or perhaps you're looking for corporate investment partners, feel free to reach out to us through our Slack channel, which can be found in the description. Because we meet a lot of people in this space, we set aside time each week to make introductions to the various people that we encounter. This is something we do free of charge in order to help these incredible companies solving climate change to scale. Looking forward to hearing from you in the Slack channel. Yeah, for me, Clean Tech 1.0 was like 2000 to like 2007 um, because this was like the promise of the hydrogen economy. So I got to see this like first foray, uh, solar cells were becoming more ubiquitous. Um, saw that then translate into that 2010, I would call kind of like 2.0. It was, it was like a resurgence. When we used to think about wasted food in, you know, 2007 to 2000, probably like 15, it really was this idea of keep it out of landfills. Uh, the personal experience for us, and, and as we built the business, the awareness element uh, really started to inform better solutions and just how do we think about this problem even differently? How much further can we take this? It's not just about keeping good food out of landfill. How do you keep good food in the food supply chain? And that entire food loss part of the equation, uh, a very large missed opportunity. It continues to be a missed opportunity. Uh, for us, it was the the building of our first full-scale facility in, in Los Angeles County. We had a partnership with Kroger, probably our first major success as a business, uh, incredible project with Kroger. Uh, they were innovative and, and pushing forward into meeting uh, AB 1826, the food waste ban in California, partnered with three guys in a, in a basement. Um, so incredibly courageous on Kroger's part. And we built this facility. It is, it's at their distribution center. Uh, all of the food that can't be sold or donated from their stores returned back to the distribution center. And we process it right there into renewable energy that feeds their supply chain. But what's really interesting and, and what was probably largely unexpected, when we flipped the switch on the facility, you started to see all of this material come back from these stores. So you're sitting on the receiving dock. And for the first time, you have over 300 stores sending back a, a bin of food that they said couldn't be sold or donated. And you're seeing this product come through. And you look in the bin, like the, and even to this day at our facilities, you look in the bin and you're, you just say, why are they throwing away this apple? There's a small blemish. Or look at all of this. Look at all the bananas that may be over ripened um, or things that aren't even at date code that are that are leaving the shelves and leaving the food supply chain. So that for us was the impetus to reimagining how to solve this problem. So it's not just about the infrastructure. It's about how do we make our food supply chain stronger and more intelligent. Mm -hmm. That's kind of interesting. So what I'd like to do is have you break down for people unaware. I mean, this is myself included. How traditionally does this supply chain look from producer to store to landfill or wherever it goes just break break down those key components for us like you're explaining it to your grandma and then let's juxtapose that to what you're doing and then kind of the the change and making it a little bit more circular here yeah i love that so i'll probably focus mostly on produce um maybe even strawberries because strawberries you know one of the uh, most important food items fresh items within the retail sector so strawberries grown all over the world uh, we're importing strawberries right now from Mexico, for example. Uh, so they're on the field. They're gonna, they're going to seed, water, provide nutrients, time, harvest, and then it goes into a pre-cool on the farm. So they're gonna bring that produce down into temperature, and that's gonna preserve its its life. They then start moving that through the supply chain, 
So it's going to start like a Driscoll strawberry. It's going to then start to move through their supply chain on a truck that's going directly deadheading to a retail location. So a retail distribution center. Now that could be California, which is just over the border, or it could be where I am in Massachusetts or you in New York. That same truck has to travel 3,000, 4,000 miles. The truck has to stay at temperature. So plenty of opportunity for failure for that product to deviate from temperature, to get too cold, too warm, lose life, lose freshness. But once it gets to the distribution center, you know, the retailer is taking ownership of the product at that point. So the, the transportation company owns it in transit. It arrives. The retailer is going to do a quality control. So they're going to open up the door of that truck. They're going to see, are there, are there pests? Is it at temperature? Is this the quality? Is it the size berry that we agreed to? If the answer to any of those questions is no, they're going to close the door and they're going to tell the driver, we reject your delivery. And that's sort of like that first instance where you've now done all of this work and you've put all this value into this product um, and it leaves the food supply chain because now you have a driver who has to find a home for it. And that's towards the end of the supply chain, but it even gets worse. So now it goes into the distribution center and you know distribution centers in the retail sector are, are pretty efficient. They're going to bring that product in. And if it's a high volume product like strawberries, they're gonna turn that product within 24 hours. That's really the, the objective. Uh, things that we've seen, uh, when you're loading that fresh product out uh, and you have high volume situations, just like uh, grocery retailers seeing massive growth over the over the pandemic, they're going to start utilizing dock space that isn't refrigerated. So all of that fresh product that really needs to live at like that 36 degrees Fahrenheit, they start loading out onto warm docks. So that product is losing life because it's on a 55 degree dock. And these are the things that inadvertently happen. It goes into a re retail trailer. They're going to drive it to the store. Store it unloads that trailer. It may sit on the back dock for four hours, five hours. If they don't have the produce cooler ready or if the back room attendant is inefficient, uh, it goes into the produce cooler. Produce cooler door is left open, so it's not at temperature. They're instead of sitting at 36 degrees, it's sitting at 46 degrees. It goes onto the sales floor. And we see this stuff happening in retailers all the time where they're overloading their U-boats. Instead of understanding that they need to bring five cases of strawberries onto the sales floor, they bring their entire U-boat. They bring all their inventory of strawberries onto the sales floor. All that product, again, is losing life. Now, by the time they get to those strawberries in the cooler, uh, the strawberries may not have the quality that they need. It may be, it may be moldy. It may be discolored. Uh, it may be blemished. And so they then have to toss it. And it's all of these touch points that are happening to our food through the entire supply chain. It's incredibly complex. It's very people driven, very process driven, uh, a lot of opportunity for mistakes uh, and loss of loss of fresh, fresh food. Hey there, are you building a climate tech business and looking for very specialized talent? Consider reaching out to our sponsors, Next Wave Partners. Next Wave are experts in talent acquisition, recruitment, and retention across the climate tech, renewables, and ESG spaces globally. So if your team is growing or you're looking to make a career change yourself, feel free to reach out to Next Wave at next-wavepartners.com or reach out to one of their consultants directly via their LinkedIn page. Okay, and then so what happens if, I mean, once they decide to reject it, it usually goes to where? I uh, Typically in the U.S., and I think a lot of our customers have done it incredible job of, of not letting this happen, but it, traditionally it would go into landfill. So all of that water then the nutrients that we put into that food is, is now sent into a landfill. Uh, leachate within landfills is really all of that fresh food is breaking down. We lost the, the nutrients forever. We obviously have uh, nutrient issues in the US. We lost the water uh, that was put mm -hmm. onto fields, transported. Now it becomes landfill leachate. It's going to percolate through the landfill. It's going to pick up heavy metals, PFOAs, all other kinds of nasties that then leave the landfill and they have to go get treated separately. Uh, you're also breaking down in an anaerobic environment in a landfill. And those, even with a landfill gas capture system, you're still going to lose 50 to 75% of that methane that's created it goes into the atmosphere. Uh, obviously that's a, that's a huge driver of climate change. So what, what we're doing, that juxtaposition that you spoke of, it's really, it's, it's taking that experience that we had when we first built our, our first facility. It's, it's bringing that impact, that experience of seeing product come back, 
And at the same time, providing our customers with a solution that allows them to keep this food out of landfill, allows us to recover the water, recover the nutrients, recover the energy, and provide a, a scalable solution for them that's that's operating at an infra, you know, infrastructure uh, level process. So this isn't a, you know, a one-off small operation. These are things we're servicing thousands of retailers across the country. Mm -hmm. So just to clarify, I'm going to, I'm going to ask some, some short and some long questions here. The clients that you serve are, are the retailers. They are the Correct. ones who pay, pay for this service. Okay. And do they pay for this as a service or do you have any kind of model where you end up uh, purchasing the purchasing the waste and then creating energy out of it. Cause I'm assuming they have some costs associated with actually um, getting rid of the waste in the first place, usually correct. So the way we contract with customers, it's, it's, it's on a subscription basis. And then there's a small processing fee. So the way we contract is to align ourselves with our customers. The person who should be the, the way to make money for food is to send it through the front door of the grocery mm -hmm. store and, and not the back door. So mm -hmm. we want to help our retailers do that. And if we can help our retailers reduce wasted food, uh, then we have a customer for life because now we are helping them run a better business. That's our objective. And so the way that we interact, the way that we help donation programs, the way that we're creating data products to understand what is leaving the supply chain and why, those are the things that become very important that help our customers sell their food. When that can't happen and when there are breakdowns in the process, and there are going to always be coolers that fail, uh, unfortunately, there will be mishaps. Uh, they need a place to put that product. Uh, and so we also provide that service. So all of these things together uh, provide that make money from food, keep it in the food supply chain. That's the easiest, best way to make money from food. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. So maybe let's break down a couple of those things. You, you mentioned a number of touch points from once the truck arrives, and if they accept the, the the delivery, you said there's a number of touch points in there. Which of those touch points are you providing any type of solution? And can you break down each of those solutions along the way? Yeah, we have, uh, we've had some pilot products that uh, we prototyped and piloted with customers that went as far as the the every single touch point. So we modeled out the entire supply chain. Um, and that data for us is you have, your kale is in the wrong position in your produce cooler. Instead of being on the top shelf, it needs to be in the bottom shelf because it's not as temperature sensitive uh, as other products. Uh, we can bring in KPIs when we look at when product is delivered uh, these are sensors that are integrating multi-sensory input. So we're looking at vibration, temperature, humidity, light, and other inputs that when you look at that, uh, that those input streams against what should be happening in retail, you can then drive insights in understanding those KPIs that are really going uh, unmeasured, but are best managed practices at every single grocery store. Like there's only one way to move a strawberry through your supply chain. Um, and this is something that's been, you know, studied extensively by folks like Foxy, Driscoll Strawberries, et cetera, the California uh, Strawberry Institute. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that was the first part. And then you said once they, you know, that's basically helping them actually sell more of it, right? So it's not going bad before it gets Correct. sold, right? So then after, if there is waste, then are they, you said that you work with some larger retailers. I'm assuming they may conglomerate uh, a location. Maybe they have a distribution center in a certain area. Correct. Do they send it all back to one place? How does that work and, and what happens with it then? So we're using reverse logistics, which is a process that allows us to not put additional trucks on the road. So our carbon intensity from an operations perspective, uh, far lower than, than others. Because when that, store, when that truck delivers fresh produce, that apple that can't be sold because it's bruised or blemished and they, they can't donate it, uh, that's put into a bin. Uh, that's FISMA approved, uh, Food Safety Modernization Act, sorry for the acronym. Uh, and then it's going to be brought back to the distribution center with bales of cardboard, pallets, plastic film, other store displays, all goes back to the DC. So they'll sweep that, they'll, they'll then organize those, they'll, they'll cross dock it, and load out our trailer that is filled with our bins. And then we'll pull that to, a, to our location offsite from the distribution center.
Hey there, thanks for listening to this episode. If you've made it this far, it's likely that you're enjoying the show, so I wanted to ask your help. If you're enjoying it, please give us a review on Apple Podcasts and share with somebody in the same industry who might find this interesting. And if you're interested in getting summaries of these episodes, go subscribe to our newsletter that comes out on LinkedIn and Substack. Links can be found in the description. Thanks for your help in growing the reach of this show. That allows us to work with multiple retailers in one area, allows us to fo- mm. focus on population centers, allows us to achieve scale. There is no one retailer. There's no one uh, business company that has enough wasted food. And we don't want there to be because we don't want to create a perverse incentive where you're Mm -hmm. creating infrastructure to manage what is really costing you a significant amount of money. Uh, So retailers, for example, the average grocery store has a net profit of $40,000 per month. That same grocery store is going to buy and throw away $40,000 per month of food. What we would love to see happen is we eliminate that entire $40,000. We could double their profit margins. So that's the journey we're on. So we don't want our customers investing in infrastructure. Let us do it. Uh, And then for us, it's today we manage just under half a percent of the food waste in the U.S. A full build out is 5%. So there will always be wasted food uh, for us to go after. And so we can help our customers reduce wasted food uh, with that type of structure and then leveraging that reverse logistics process to scale across multiple retailers. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then just a one real quick one I want to touch on is you mentioned that some of the food may not be, you know, I, for example, shop with imperfect foods. I like to, to shop. I'm too lazy to go to the grocery store personally. Um, So that's part of the reason, but I know that they have this thing where some things are, are not quote unquote fit for uh, retail selling and in the stores. So they get rejected, but it's perfectly good. What does yep. it look like with um, where the donations go to? Because obviously some of this food goes, it gets donated. Are you involved in that? Or is that typically the retailer automatically has something in place? Or do you also help with those logistics? Uh, we do. We donated over 11 million pounds of food um, as a business. And, you know, that's roughly, uh, that's annually, by the way. And so what that allows us to do is to work through processes and bring in efficiencies where they may not exist. So it's not about just re- recycling wasted food and t- trying to turn that into energy. That is not uh, what we are in business for. We are in business to tackle and, and solve that wasted food crisis. Um, on the on the other side, what you're referring to, like sort of those secondary, so carrots that you know are maybe a little bit funky or maybe interesting, if you will, hmm. um, that a retailer doesn't can't put on the shelves. They need consistent. They need that, like you walk into the grocery store and you just feel like there's this bountiful, uh, high value, just beautiful looking produce. Uh, so we have a consumer problem as well. And Imperfect Foods, great example of, you know, breaking down this those misnomers or misconceptions of what is good food. Uh, we really need to value food differently. And that's why for, from our business, it's protect the value of food. And so we love to see things like Imperfect Foods, Afresh, everybody taking it as their own unique approach to solving the wasted food crisis. Mm-hmm. Okay, got it. So with that, then I'm guessing, it, I would be curious if you can comment on it. I'm not sure if this is inside of your remit, but are they able, are the retailers able to sell to those sec- kind of quote unquote secondary sellers? Or does that happen at the beginning of the time when they are taking food and they're rejecting things? It's, it's at the beginning mm. of that process. So it's off the farm. Farmers are going through and they're saying, look, these apples don't have the size requirements. Um, But on the other side, when you are at the retail uh, side, um, the food makes its way there. It it is an opportunity for donation. The challenge is logistics. A lot of food pantries, food banks are volunteer driven. Mm -hmm. So what you're requiring is somebody to show up every single day for a consistent program. it's hard for retailers to interface with that type of operation where it's not a consistent, um, they don't really want to donate because, you know, if they were really doing their jobs, they would have sold that food. And that's more important for them as a business to be sustainable and and be relevant. So it it is a hard process. There are some creative solutions out there right now, flash food, for example, Uh, you know, how do you take food that is approaching its date code? How do you bring that back in? Uh, into that merchant and how do you bring a new shopper into the store so flash food offering discount food 
that may drive more uh, more foot traffic into an individual store. That person may fill up their basket with other solutions. So again, we love to see those types of solutions in place. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, so then I want to go back to once once you have the you know the actual waste products and you're taking them from the distribution center to your facility. Um, I'm assuming so you turn this into power. How does that work? Are you selling to the utility? Are you selling it somehow back to the retailers um, for their own energy consumption? How, can you walk us through that process and how that model works? So first process for us, typically uh, wasted food, food coming out of retail is going to have packaging and packaging could be, you know, that that plastic stretch wrap that's on your cucumbers now for some reason. Uh, it could be an apple sticker. It could be rubber bands on broccoli, twist ties, uh, the little plastic uh, tags on pineapples. All of that is contamination. So what we can't do, we can't uh, we can't put that into compost because that's typically not something that's removed. So it just works its way through compost. Um, and then you're going to see it when you spread it on land. So that's, that's a really difficult process um, to manage inside of that compost thing. So what we do is we have a mechanical process that's going to liquefy all of that wasted food. And then we're able to screen out from the liquid all of the contaminants. So plastic, metal, glass, uh, and the other things like peach pits, uh, we're going to remove that. That is then uh, put into a two-stage anaerobic digestion process. It's a naturally occurring process. It's naturally occurring bacteria. Uh, we have two different reactors. The first phase is to what we call hydrolyze that, that, that material. So it's a liquid at that point. And we're trying to create uh, short chain fatty acids. Those short chain fatty acids are then metered into our methanogenic reactor. That methanogenic reactor is filled with naturally occurring bacteria. It's very safe. You know, the pH is 7.2. So it's, um, you know, 3% solids. It kind of looks like really rich soil it has that color, it has that smell. But what's happening, all that bacteria are eating those volatile fatty acids, all of the material that we fed into it. And they're taking the carbon and only the carbon, and they're able to metabolize that into a form that is called biogas. And biogas is a combination of methane and carbon dioxide. So it's about 60% methane and 40% carbon dioxide. And it's a natural fuel. What's left are all the nutrients and minerals, and we're able to, to remove those from the reactor. Uh, and then we send that off into compost, and that's blended in to enhance compost. Um, and then that biogas, we're able to take that fuel, and we could do a few things with it. Uh, right now, we're turning that into electricity, and we're feeding that back into our customers' local grids. We also have a project uh, and several projects underway where that gas will be removed, uh, the carbon dioxide will be removed and the methane will be put into uh, pipelines so that we can then feed homes. And there's a better energy conversion with that uh, when we think about that fuel uh, removing natural gas and we can put a renewable fuel into those pipelines, that existing infrastructure. Uh, and then our carbon intensity, when you look at the life cycle analysis, uh, our carbon intensity is like a negative 70. Uh, if you were to compare that to the carbon intensity of natural gas, you're in like the plus 70. So it's a very efficient fuel. Uh, it's more renewable than than even wind turbines uh, because wind turbines would have a life cycle analysis of just something north of, of, of zero. Uh, so it's an exciting fuel. It's a byproduct of what we do, but um, important. Okay, interesting. <laughs> so given that these retailers, I mean, there's obviously some pooled resources and in, in order to make this kind of effective at scale, but are there, are they able to take advantage of any carbon credits because they're kind of diverting from at least the baseline of, of what other retailers are, are doing? Uh, carbon credits are, are a complex topic. Um, I would say that they're able to, to get the benefit of carbon credits because we can make the investment into the infrastructure and the, you know, that, that carbon balancing or the value of the fuel that we can produce on the back end, that's where we're sort of capturing that, that benefit, you know, whether it's, it's a REC or a RIN, um, or it's, it's benefit, it's valued in that voluntary energy market, which is what we, uh, we've been able to participate in. They're getting the benefit because we can actually supplement that infrastructure, the recycling process for them, 
Um, and that's where we're taking advantage. That's where we're getting credit for all of the avoided emissions from having recycling is on that back end fuel. So, so yes, but somewhat indirectly. Mm -hmm. So just to clarify that part, are they, are they the ones being able to say, Hey, you know, we can apply this to our own net zero targets, or is it something that divert is, is doing and then being able to take that and sell it on the market to make the, the business model work? So we own, we own the fuel. Uh, we own the assets, we own the fuel produced from the assets. Um, they, how that's accounted for in their sustainability reporting is, is on a retailer by retailer basis. Mm -hmm. Okay. Got it. Makes sense. Um, interesting. Okay. So this is, this is interesting. I think I'd like to move to the building of the business because this seems like a very logistics heavy business in general. So I'd like to, I don't know where to start exactly. Maybe we go from the beginning. So maybe what would be helpful is, could you help us understand the different phases that the technology has gone through? Because I'm assuming there was some kind of pivoting going on throughout the time and trying to figure out how it works. And especially in regards to getting investors, right? Because it's a, it sounds like it's a hardware technology, took time to prove. I'm sure there's pilots involved. Walk us through the different phases and then we yeah. can go break this down further. So, um, early days we built what was to be a behind the grocery store system so every grocery store was going to have its own anaerobic digester like depackaging system uh and then microgrid type approach uh, we built one it, it actually kind of worked uh but it was a terrible terrible idea so if you think about like scaling so we're servicing now uh, nearly 6,000 retailers across the U.S. Having 6,000 of those things in the field would be <laughs> like a total disaster. So uh, thankfully, we recognized that after building the first one, and we started to look, how do we scale this business? It's going to be too capital intensive, uh, too too difficult to maintain. And that's where we started looking at the reverse logistics process. How do we aggregate unsold food? and do it in a really efficient way. We knew working with waste haulers was never going to be the answer because <clears throat> of prior experiences, prior things we've seen in the in, in other industries and even in, within the wasted food industry uh, not go well. Um, so we had to have that direct relationship that led us to our first project with Kroger Southern California. Um, at that point, I think we raised about a million dollars and, you know, certainly not enough to go put uh, what would be now $60 million into the ground. So we had to use Kroger's balance sheet. I mean, they obviously have uh, a massive company. Um, they had the real estate. They have the problem, the problem being wasted food. And lucky for us, like a very innovative, forward thinking group. So we built our first project in Compton, California. And that site went through a period of about two to three years of having to go through uh, equipment overhauls, uh, redesign. Um, it was a lot of work. It was a lot of work to get that site to, to, to stabilize and be a, a reliable. You know, we think about that as like operability. Can we actually main, can we actually run this thing without having a team of engineers on site? So we were finally able to get it to that point. Uh, around that 2014. At that time, we then partnered with Ajo Del Hayes for Stop and Shop in the Northeast. Again, another really forward-thinking retailer. Uh, food Waste Band in Massachusetts had just gone live. And they said, we need to do something. The largest private employer in Massachusetts. And uh, they made the investment. And we were able to take all those learnings that we had with our first project, apply it to the second. And that project was has been going fantastic since. Uh, but we also realized that building these projects on our customers' balance sheets was going to be incredibly slow um, and, and and somewhat limiting because we couldn't aggregate between retailers. You know, if you had a lot of smaller retailers in a market, couldn't make it work. Uh, what we need, we needed scale. So how do you get scale? And that's what led us to our modular solution. So we have a, a modular solution in 2015, 16, 17 that we deployed uh, in the Pacific Northwest, California. Pennsylvania and other markets that allows us to bring material back, same reverse logistics process. Uh, we're doing a deep package of food waste, uh, like we talked about before, 
except the liquid we're taking to third-party digesters. It's, it's expensive. Uh, you noted logistics, a lot of logistics involved in that, but it allows us to be in a market, experience the market, service our customers. Um, about that time when we, when we achieve some, some meaningful commercial success, that's when we could attract some additional capital. So in, leading up to 2021, we raised about $5.4 million over the life of the business, which is an incredibly small amount. And 20, <laughs> I agreed. It's not even a seed round now, which is yeah, sad. It's it's so tiny, especially for a hardware <laughs> company. Uh, I would even infrastructure, which is even worse because you're buying yeah. cement at that point. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, but we had the scale. We did it in a creative way. We had developed technologies that were servicing our customers, really exciting brands, nationwide scale. And then we were able to sort of leap from you know, that that small level investment into a mid-market private equity. And jumping from that VC world into private equity is just a completely different ballgame. Um, now we're partnered with our partners. We had a $200 million dollar transaction in 2021. And that was the catalyst that we needed to then take all of those modular projects take everything that we've been working on, all the experience operating these large scale digesters, managing wasted food, building out the team, taking their investment and translating that into projects on our balance sheet. And so now we will own the infrastructure. But what that allows is for us to go into many retailers and then create new verticals, go into restaurants, cafeterias, schools, and how do we help use this platform to reduce wasted food in other verticals that are outside of retail. And so that's what we're working on now. This seems very fascinating. I mean, you, you, it was a very long time to, I mean, obviously in You're terms saying of I'm startups, old? it's a very long time to get that project to go. I mean, a lot of people would give up. So I think it's uh, it's commendable that you you continued with this idea and trying to find ways that made it work, right? Because the, the truth is that there's so many of these solutions out there that are difficult in this kind of similar manner that, there is no clear financing path for it, right? It's nobody wants to touch it at the beginning, right? And the fact that you found corporates who are willing to, to work with you is, is quite fascinating. I think that's something for, for other founders listening to take away is consider these, these corporate partnerships at the beginning. So this is a good point. I mean, this is something that's come up recently on the, on the show is this idea of going from VC or you know working with your client's money to project financing. Can you talk about um, how... What specifically needed to be proven to these mid-market private equity that they were willing to do this? I'm assuming largely on a uh, on a project finance play for each project, correct? Um, so we so we took an equity from the private from private equity, um, but that was to leverage into project finance. So to your earlier point, I strongly agree. The idea that we had corporates that were willing to sign up, we would not be here with Oak Kroger or Ajo Delis. That's, that's very true. And even our current customers that, that are propelling growth across the country. Uh, but it's those relationships also that got us into private equity um, and then also got us into project finance. So we just closed green bonds in California. So I think roughly like $64 million in green bonds. And that, that private financing in that capital market. So we just... And we just recently closed like in this market when banks are failing and Silicon Valley Bank went under like two weeks ago, like the fact that we could get that done is absolutely incredible. And <laughs> <laughs> like to try to get that done now. So, you're, you know, to your question, like, so how, like, why were we able to do that? It's because we've been operating digesters for 10 years. We have incredible brands behind us. Uh, we have the pricing power to make these projects work. We have the team in place. We have the experience. All of those things coming together. It was a large effort to to getting out of the line. And then we had our, our announcement with Enbridge. Uh, Enbridge put in uh, between them and uh, existing investors, uh, you know, another hundred million dollars of of equity into the business. But even more importantly, Enbridge pledged a billion dollars to go build assets. So we go back to that experience with Kroger and Aho putting them on their balance sheet. Uh, now we get to use somebody else's balance sheet again. Enbridge wants to be in the game. They want to drive the energy transition. Uh, we're supportive of that. 
And we're excited by the fact that, that we get to build projects that really wouldn't be able to uh, enter the market because they just have competitive capital and they're excited about the space. So now we have a billion dollars, we have the cash on hand to, to fuel our growth and they'll 100% finance those projects. It's, it's, um, it's a very exciting time. Could you, for people unfamiliar, because it's my understanding that a lot of people starting climate tech companies, I mean, a lot of people, not everybody, of course, are more familiar with VC. So could you maybe just break down a couple of the key things if you were kind of mentoring somebody else building a company in this space, similar again, infrastructure related or hardware related, what are the differences between it? How, how would these things work compared to VC just to help people understand? Yeah, I, I'd probably classify VC as growth stage. Um, there are some VCs, uh, maybe I misspoke, private equity I'd classify as growth stage. VCs, I think, have, have, have sometimes stepped into those roles you know, when you're writing $100, $200 million checks. Um, but typically, that would be the private equity side. And you, know, you have a proven business model. You have commercial success. Uh, you have revenue. You've demonstrated gross margins. And now it's time to, to accelerate to a different scale. Um, that's, that's the role of, of private equity uh, on the mid market side. Of course, you know, private equity these days can, can mean anything, um, going into billions and billions of dollars of transactions or even into a single transaction, but that mid market, um, is really unique. It, and again, to, to a comment you made earlier, the idea that we have investment coming into the infrastructure side. So venture capital uh, investing into infrastructure. Infrastructure is typically looked at kind of boring. It's kind of stayed. It's slow. It's slower growth. There's, you know, you have permitting risks and all these other challenges uh, that come with it. It's not software, um, but it is really important that we do make investments into our infrastructure. We solve these problems on a nationwide scale. And that's the role of, of private equity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I'm just kind of curious how how it works with valuation with infrastructure. I'm not super familiar with that. Obviously, you know, in a software company, they just basically say, "Hey, how much is your how much is your annual recurring revenue?" And then what do we expect for growth? And they just give you a multiple, right? And then they'll they'll dump money in. But when you've only done a few projects, like you've did, and you have the technology proven, but not necessarily any clear graph to say, "Okay, here here's how many customers we're gaining right now. Here's our customer mm -hmm. acquisition cost." Like how do you then go about valuing that to not completely destroy your cap table if you're taking on equity? So uh, your TAM, right? You, you have to have a big enough total addressable market to make the mm -hmm. investment worthwhile. It can't be that you're going to build just one project because then you're just a project development company. So you have to have that, that, same, that same thesis where you have a large enough market you're showing trajectory. Early on, one of our one of our board members, uh, former founder of Charles River Ventures, early VC company from the '70s, uh, very successful. He he referenced what we were doing as the quality of our revenue. And I always thought that was really interesting. So the idea that we don't have to go worry about eyeballs, like once you build and once you solve this problem for somebody, I can tell you pretty accurately how many tons of wasted food we're going to process next week. And I can tell you next year how many tons of wasted food and I can really project our revenue. So you have, you have, you have a revenue stream that can be forecasted. It can be built upon it's protectable. And so you have a different investment thesis at that point that it's not, you know, eyeballs or, or top line growth. You, you can show gross margins on those. Uh, and so how do you value that? It depends on the investor, you know, whether it's a discount of cash flows or they're going to run an NPV and their investments, uh, or if you're going into the public markets, what the multiple and terminal value would be. Um, that, that's depending on, on the source of the capital. And then so with this being, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but to me, this seems like it's a new type of infrastructure, at least relatively speaking. Right. Maybe it's not as new. How do they, you know, obviously they understand the quality of your, as you said, the quality of your revenue. So that's great, by the way. Quality of your revenue is good but how do they determine hey you're going to have clients people are going to people are going to sign up for this did you have to go and get some type of commitments from people like how, how did that work 
So we have contracts in place for all of our customers. So, you know, and we're also showing store growth. So we can say, look, we're working with so-and-so. Uh, we were at 500 stores two years ago, and now we're at 1,200 stores. And they're name brands. And so if it's working for, for that very large national retailer, mm. uh, it's probably going to work for the local retailer. Those national retailers have more scale. They have more purchase power. So if you could do it with them, you should be able to do it with others. So it should translate. Uh, that's certainly part, part of that process. And in terms of like the need for the infrastructure, um, you know, it's the mega trends. Uh, we have about 17 years left of landfill capacity in the U.S. and the Northeast where you and I are located. We have about seven years. Uh, landfills are closing. Our trash is going further. Our trash in Massachusetts goes to South Carolina, which is terrible. But it happens because we don't have the infrastructure. And it would be nearly impossible to build a new landfill. Like I can't even imagine where in Massachusetts we would put a landfill, which means we're not sustainable as a state. What are we going to do with our resources? So you can then build incinerators, uh, which are ter which also have their own challenges. Uh, you can compost, but you know we have the microplastics issues. You can't compost very large volumes of food waste. Food waste is 30% of what goes into the trash um, so then that sort of leaves this natural void of, well, what are we going to do with it? And we believe that anaerobic digestion is the appropriate process for that. You can do it in urban industrial environments close to the source. Um, and so there, that sort of perpetuates this, I, this investment thesis of we need infrastructure. There is no other real solution. Climate change is not going away. We need sustainable solutions. And, and, that's, um, and that's really where we come out. Interesting. Okay. That's... Um... That's fascinating. I mean, I had no idea. I guess I never, obviously I live in New York city and I see the trash being taken away every day, but I never thought we'd have a, a problem with when we run out. It's kind of like uh cloudy with a chance of meatballs, a bit of a reminder for that, that <laughs> cartoon. Um, I'm, I am curious because this is, seems like a relatively, I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's a lot of other companies in the space, but how did you go about attracting talent? You know, what was your strategy at the beginning? Obviously early days probably had to have people who were genuinely motivated. Just talk about this process and maybe any of the phases that you went through with talent acquisition. Uh, building our team has to be one of the most important and challenging parts of building a business. Like how do you, how do you build something that scales beyond yourself? Uh, when you can't be in every meeting, you can't be in every discussion, you, you have to allow others to uh, bring creativity. Their vision is being executed. So how do you bring that into the business? And um, it obviously comes down to culture. It comes down to who are you hiring? Who do you trust? Like who brings in the passion? Who really wants to solve this problem? Are you aligned on mission? And if you're aligned on mission and everything is always about the business, what's best for the business, not the individual, uh, then you start to get to some really interesting dynamics that I do think scale, and that's where we've had a lot of success. Uh, creativity, the ability to deal with ambiguity, self-motivated, those are the things that we look for in individuals. And when you bring those types of individuals, they wanna work with more individuals and they wanna bring other people that they know uh, into that group. So we've had a lot of success. Obviously the the, the, the PR uh, helps as well, drive people like to say, okay, this is, this is a business that is taking off uh, I want to be associated with it. This is where I want to spend my time so I can have impact. Um, those things are also contributing factors. Do, do you see a lot of people coming from the conventional spaces that are looking to get into this or people who are motivated by this stuff and they, they, you know, they're looking for an opportunity and they find it. I'm kind of curious because what I have heard from some people on, on the show is when they're taking old uh, conventional ways and changing them, sometimes people are they're kind of like indifferent. Sometimes they're really excited. Just kind of curious what you've seen there. Yeah. I, so we have, we're, we're building large complex type facilities. We have people from the oil and gas industry you, you, and like the, the experience from oil and gas of dealing with high pressure methane, uh, complex machinery, uh, the ability to run in mass balance and energy balance, safety, reliability. Like these are the things that we need to have inside of our facilities. So we've been very lucky that we've had uh, some folks that want to transition uh, from one part of that uh, oil and gas industry and the energy industry into you know what we're doing and, and our approach uh, to that. The same thing on uh, on logistics or customer customer success. 
Um, you know, we're looking for diversity of thought. We're looking for diversity, uh, DEI within the business as well. And so how do we drive all of these um, that then attract more individuals from outside of those more traditional groups? I think we offer an exciting platform to, to grow your career and be part of something bigger than yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, I find it, I find it pretty interesting that the, I mean, obviously my day job being in talent, the intersection of climate tech and obviously it's aligned with esg i I guess you could say values and i think i've seen a lot of companies that despite being climate tech companies don't necessarily take talent seriously which is obviously a huge component of the s aspect and it's interesting to see you know i don't know if you have any specific things you want to comment on there but i have noticed a lot of companies think oh you know we're doing we're we're helping clean up the the environment so as a result we, we don't have to worry about anything else they might treat their employees crappy. Like I see it all the time in the back end of talking to people and hearing their moans about it. But um, any comments that you have on this and how you guys handle things and to make sure that not only are you helping the environment overall, but also being as a company in alignment with those things? I, I think people is a really complex element of all businesses. Um, it, it For us, it comes down to the business, our mission is bigger than any one person. Um, you can you can quickly identify the people who are worried about the me, you know, and and not and not the mission. Um, they may tell themselves that they're associated with the mission, that they really care about the mission, but you know, th- those are the things when you start to solve for that, and we're all aligned on how do we tackle this. I think it's being open, inclusive, listening. Uh, just being a place where people want to work. And and I do think that those things somewhat take care of themselves and feedback. I think there has to be accountability as well. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I think that that is something I've noticed is if people, uh, if people are aligned with what they're doing, I mean, they'll, they'll really put in the effort and they'll, they'll do what it takes to actually make the company itself better. Like if there are holes because nobody's perfect, right. Mm -hmm. They will find ways to make those solutions. So it's, it's interesting to hear. I know we're running out of time here. So I'd like to, I guess, just ask your final thoughts on what you're excited for next with uh, divert and where you see the industry as a whole going probably over the coming two or three years. Yeah. uh, What I'm excited about, we are in an incredibly unique position. We're, we're better capitalized, more experienced, uh, the most exciting partnerships, customers uh, in the space that we really can make a go in creating an entire industry of solving this wasted food and being that platform. So that's what's really exciting to me. I, you know, after, I don't know, we're on 16 years now, I guess. Um, we're finally here. We, I think we really know who we are. We know our model. We have an, an just incredible team uh, ready to go. And um, yeah, we're, we're in execution mode now. So over the next two years, I think you'll see more exciting press releases coming. Uh, you'll see more impact. Our, our, our ability to contribute uh, will be far greater uh, over the coming years. So excited to see what happens. That's great. I think um, it's honestly, I, I have to say, I know I said it before, but I think it's really incredible that you guys stuck with it for that long because, <laughs> you know, it seems as though you, you mentioned at the beginning, what, five and a half million you had raised by by 2021. Like that's a very long time to have just kind of, you know, grin, grin and bear it, you know, get, get through yeah. it. And um, it's really fascinating. I mean, it's interesting to me because, you know, I come from working and recruiting in the renewable space, which is obviously at one point was a new infrastructure play and now a new kind of infrastructure industry popping up. So really fascinating stuff. Thanks so much for coming on. Any final thoughts or where people can reach you? Uh, yeah, I feel like LinkedIn is is sort of my, my go-to at this point. So uh, happy to connect, love to connect with everybody and um, share our mission. Awesome. Appreciate it. Thanks for the Very opportunity. Good. Yeah, thanks so much, Ryan. It's been a pleasure. Thanks.